Good morning, everybody. Good to talk with you a little bit um, this morning about meditation. Maybe dispel some myths about it. Share with you my experience because that's the only thing that's really relative. Um, Why I got into it, why I continue to do it today, the benefits to me from it. Um, In a nutshell, the, you know, the voices that you all have going, some of them right now, voices that were talking to you when your eyes first popped open this morning. Well, those voices drove me into an insane asylum between my ninth and tenth year of sobriety. From the day I was born up till then, I was completely identified with the voice and what it told me. And if you have paid much attention to anything Eckhart Tolle tells you, is when you're identified with your mind, your mind has only one or two places it operates. Where, where, where are those two places? Do you remember? No. When you're identified with your mind, it, it, there's only two places it will ever take you. Go, go into your experience this morning. Hasn't your mind either taken you into your past or into the future? When you're identified with your mind, that's where you live. You're never here. Think of the dialogue from the time you got up till right now. I can't promise you it's been, been about your past or the future. And you have not been here. When you are identified, if you go through the rest of your life remaining identified with your mind, that's how you will live. I think it's the reason, if there's such a thing as reincarnation, I think it's the reason we reincarnate five, six, seven, eight hundred times. Because in a lifetime, we're present maybe an hour. The only place you'll have conscious contact with God, by the way, is in the present moment. To know God, you must be out of your mind. What your mind tells you of God is probably not of God. It is probably information you have learned, been taught, read about, blah, blah, blah. To think that words on a page could explain what God is, is being awful naive. My mind between my ninth and tenth year drove me insane and created severe mental and emotional disorders within me. I did it to me. Probably 70% of you have, quote, a dual diagnosis, right? Is that true? A lot of you have that? The more self-obsessed you are, the more severe mental and emotional disorders you will experience. Because it's always about that voice, and it's always about you, 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 and the voice constantly pulling you. And, and, And it took me into a Great Depression, The voice even had me convinced that the life was so painful that we needed to commit suicide and end end it. The ultimate act of playing God, is it not? Isn't that the ultimate act of playing God? I'm going to decide when my spirit leaves the body. Fortunately, through a series of events, I wound up in a psychiatric hospital instead of killing myself. And in that place, which is why I have no sympathy for any of you who ever complain about anything here, (laughs) it was a lockdown nut house, Houston, Texas, hospital, sterile. They had some real wackos in there, so you had big burly security guards in addition to, quote, decks. And, uh, I had great insurance and it kept me for 38 days. That wasn't good either. But uh, I took a look at the big book, and in particular the 10th and 11th step, and I asked myself some very honest questions. What had I not been doing that the book had asked me to do? And the thing I'd never done was meditate. I prayed. I would open the big book upon awakening, but I had never meditated, which is mentioned several times in the book and in particular is mentioned in the 11th step as a means of staying in fit spiritual condition. I also woke up to something else. Some of you, for example, how many of you have no experience with meditation? Raise your hands. 
But I'll bet you all have opinions about it, don't you? My opinion about an experience I've never had is useless. So is yours. I got that. So if I was going to have an experience with meditation, I needed to meditate. Because I placed myself in the nut house. Completely identified with my mind and its incessant chatter and living in the past and in the future. Creating how many of you suffer from anxiety? All anxiety is is you're identified with your mind in the psychological time of the future. God gave you and I the, the the tools and the skills to be here and live with now, today, but nothing beyond that. So the great the extent to which your mind has you out here is the extent to which you will produce anxiety. How many of you remember Mike Page? Mike spent most of his time here wondering what was going to happen when he stood in front of the judge last week. Now that whole thing took nine months. Over nine months, most of the time his head had him there playing out the story. Of course, it didn't work out the way he planned. It worked out far better. So, I went out and I got a few books on meditation. You don't hear much about meditation in the United States of America, in the Western culture. Very few religions. I was raised a Methodist, became a Catholic, This little girl had something I wanted. She said if I wanted to get it, I had to become a Catholic. I said, not a problem. Well, let me ask this question, uh, because a lot of you come from many varied religious backgrounds. Has any one of them ever moved you into meditation? How many of you believe in the Bible, the words in the Bible? The Bible makes many references to meditation. Be still and know that I am God. Yet, our religious teachers in the United States, regardless of the denomination, do not teach meditation. You can't teach what you're not doing. So I looked at the book and saw what I hadn't been doing, so I went and I got some general information. And this is really all the general information you probably need to know. Here's number one. Do it. Do it every day. Do it for a period of time. If you don't like the effect it produced, stop. Do what you're doing. Which is listening to the voices. That was number one. It was suggested, if possible, to do it at the same time every day. Because the human beings are, by nature, creatures of habit. And I've seen the value in that. My alarm goes off at 4.46 every morning. I do my prayer and meditation between 5 and 5.45. I wind up doing that seven days a week, whether I need to get up or not, because now it's become a habit. I do it if I feel great. I do it if I don't feel great. I do it if I'm happy. I do it if I'm sad, because I got in the habit of doing it. I still do it today, because I went into the insane asylum in 1991, and I'm still doing it today. Why? Why would I do that? Because I like the effect produced by meditation. I have a life being sober prior to meditation, and I have a life after, and it's like I've lived two different lifetimes. I also started out with a timer. I've been a around athletics a lot, so I I understood the idea of discipline doing things every day. When I first began to meditate, the silence felt violent to me. I had no idea my voice, the voices in my head never stopped until I began to meditate. So I'd start to meditate. It was it was crazy. I call it the chatter of a thousand monkeys. That's why some of you on a three minute meditation, 15 seconds into it, you pop your eyes open, hoping the three minutes is up. 
unavailable, unwilling to meet yourself in that place. The basics that I got out of the meditation were focus on breath. Breathe in through the nose, breathe out through your mouth. In some cases, what would happen, uh, would also be beneficial to some of you, is you could also pick a word that has some sacred or holy significance to you. The word that I use is Jesus when I meditate. Now, you could use God, you could use spirit, you could use love, you could use whatever you want. When the voices start talking, I breathe in and say the word, and breathe out and say the word, and I don't care about the voices. They just go on and on and on. Sometimes I use numbers, count one to ten, and if a thought interrupts the number, I start over. I've never made it to ten. Do you understand what I just said? Breathe in, I'm, I'm doing one. Breathe out, I'm doing two. Breathe in, I'm doing three. If I could do that, no thought interrupts my voice saying the number in my mind, then I don't have to start over. Right? Breathe in, one. What are you going to do at 11.30 today? Start over. Breathe in. But you got to work out today at noon do the legs. You know the legs are hard. Start again. See? I think I've made it to eight once. No idea of chatter going on in my mind. Unbelievable. But I got the concept of doing it, setting the timer, doing it. Focus on breath. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And then over a very period of time, and actually very quickly, I began to experience the benefits of meditation. What were some of them? I was not as afraid. It was one of the most significant things I noticed. Anxiety that I used to experience mostly about the future began to leave me. I felt that I had much more intuition. I was much more relaxed on an interior level. To even to this day, when I go to a doctor my resting pulse rate is 54. It was 74 when I started meditation. I began to, I started with seven minutes two times a day. And then I went to 10. And then I went to 15. And then I went to 20. And then sometimes on weekends, I would do it without any of the timer. Longest I ever sat and then came out of something one time was 94 minutes. I began to get tremendous benefits from the meditation. The peace I had been seeking, I began to experience and I began to be able to take that out into the world, into my daily affairs. That's why I still do it today. It benefits me physically, it benefits me emotionally. And then the greatest benefit of all, and I can't remember when after I started meditation this happened, but there came a day when a part of me began to watch myself think and that was the day I got free of being identified with my mind and its incessant chatter. And from that day to this, I remain free. When I meditate, you know that voice some of you got going right now? Is this group ever going to get over? Whatever. I just observe it. I find it to be very amusing. It is mostly repetitive. It is always about me, the mind made false sense of self. It's always about the past and it's always about the future. There's nothing creative about it. Most of the time it has nothing to do with my current reality except get out of it. If I get somewhere else, if I get home with my wife, blah, 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 whatever. Right? So my day days over, I'm going to go here. And I just watch it. Oh, that's amusing. That's funny. And I just watch it. It no longer has power over me. So that's why you use breath. Use a holy word. Because you can't stop the chatter of a thousand monkeys. 
Now they were telling me yesterday, Jason was telling me, well, the radios are going off and you, you, and doesn't matter. When you meditate, there's going to be sounds, there's going to be noises. Doesn't make any difference. You just keep breathing, focus on breath. There's one particular Zen school at the very heart of any Zen teaching is what they call Zazen, which is sitting, meditation. And one of the practices they do to see if you're into your meditation is one of the novices is given a bamboo stick, which is fairly large in size, and you'll get into your meditation, and all of a sudden they'll hit you across the back. They want to see whether or not you can continue to meditate. <laughs> now, we won't go to that extreme during this meditation, but I learned I had to ignore the noises, the belches, the farting, the fire engines, the walkie-talkie. Who cares? Do it. Meditate. Breathe. The most critical thing I found in meditation is to do it and to do it consistently with no expectations. I hear people say stuff which tells me they have no experience in meditation. I hear people say things like this. Well, is the goal to quiet your mind? No, that's impossible. You and I have absolutely no control nor where we ever have over the thoughts that arise in our mind. The only thing that you can do is shift away from the thought. Sitting here doing this holy act, some thought comes in. You can shift to God thought, shift back to your mantra, whatever it is you want to do, your breath, your holy word, come back to it, more thoughts. One of the keys is to not imagine in front of us a small little pond and all your thoughts were like leaves. What your mind wants to do is grab a leaf, bring it back, and then work with it. Let the leaves float. That's why you use a mantra, focus on breath, use numbers. It allows the leaves, your thoughts, to just float. Don't, uh, don't attempt to stop your thoughts. It is impossible. By the way, let me ask you another question. How many of you think your thoughts are confined to your brain? To the space between your ears? Have you ever thought about that? They're not. There's a steady stream of consciousness, gentlemen. It's going on all the time. It never stops. At your base level, you are energy. And that stream of consciousness. Somewhere down the road, and I hope you learn it here, you do create your own reality. And one of the major ways you create your reality is your thoughts. Constantly, repetitively, over and over and over again. You guys are like me. If you said to me what I said to me, I'd have to kill you. Then I wonder why my life's like that. I wonder why I have low self-esteem. I wonder why abundance doesn't come into my life. I wonder why I'm always going outside myself to find peace. Alcohol, drugs, women, sex, money. Why can't I just be here with me now with nothing coming in and be at peace? Why can't I? Because I'm identified with my mind. Meditation allows you to lose that. By the way, in the rooms of AA, CA, NA, you'll find very few people have any experience in meditation. Well, they pray, but very little experience with meditation. I met a man one time in Oakland, California. His name was Rinpoche, and that's a common name for holy men, but he was going to do a teaching. He was from Tibet. Been meditating for 32 years. One of the Dalai Lama's teachers. I was told he had not slept in 14 years. Being an agnostic at any given moment, I had some struggles with some of the things I heard about Rinpoche. So we went into this room to make us take your shoes off. Several of the people had been at his teachings before my first time there. 
room a little bit smaller than this. They had a chair set up. And there were a lot of big curtains and stuff. So they announced that Ripache was going to be coming, and what preceded him was all the curtains started moving. That's pretty trippy. And then he comes in and he goes up and, and he sits down, and I still to this day am not necessarily sure what happened. But he brought a power in that room that moved everything into complete silence. And then after about, we just sat there, very much a peaceful silence. His presence was that powerful. And then after about five minutes, his assistant came over and they had a like a shawl. And if he wanted to talk to somebody, they would put the shawl over you. So they came over and they put the shawl over me. So they took me over, sat down in front of him and looking into his eyes, and it was like looking to the bottom of an ocean. There was no sense of self whatsoever in this man. The reason he hadn't slept was when he goes into a meditative state, he goes into what the CD is playing right now. It's called the Delta State which is your REM sleep. He, he goes into that state immediately upon meditating, which is why he doesn't need to sleep. He can go there at will. He's always rested. Sleep in the conventional sense of the word that you and I have to do. He chose the day he would leave his body. Don't think there aren't men out there, gentlemen, doing this. Eckhart Tolle, if you ever get a chance to see him, go see him. He's a living mystic. You all know what a mystic is? Do you? For lack of a better word, it's someone who is devoid of self. The mind made false sense of self. They are devoid of it. They have died before they die. They are awake to what is. That's what a mystic is. There's been many from all religions, all walks of life. Probably many of them walking around from a clinging ladies to whatever. But they're out there. You get a chance to go see people like that. Go see people. Tolly is huge on meditation. Be still and know I am God. Be still. Intense pain and suffering caused his ego to collapse and die the death of self. And when he awakened from that, he literally sat on a park bench for two years in a state of bliss. People come up and say, I want what you have, and he would look at them and say, you already have it, you just don't know it. And then over time he evolved into, quote, a spiritual teacher. But he's a living mystic. Many of them around. Listen to almost any one of them, they're going to talk to you about meditation. And so I saw enough of that to know that I needed to try meditation. So I did. And the effects were so profound, I do it today. As a matter of fact, you said to me, what is the single most effective practice since the day you got sober? I would tell you meditation. That is why we introduce you to it here. And we will continue to do that. But keep it simple. Focus on your breath. Those of you who want to, pick a word, a word that has some significance or meaning to you. You'll breathe in, you'll breathe out with it. <clears throat> Leave your judgments about what happens. Because what happens is far beyond what your cognitive mind can grasp. Just do it. After a period of time, you'll find words to explain what's happened to you as a result of daily and consistent meditation. Now, those of you who don't want to do it, perhaps you'll have the experience I did. When you get tired of listening to its mind and its incessant chatter and the subsequent mental illness it creates in you, you might want to try it then. <laughs> That's okay. We all got to go down the road. We got to go down. Right? But you won't find a lot of teachers in meditation after you leave here. There's meditation classes you can take. I encourage you to take them. 
It's no different than a personal trainer. Do you, do you all have a better workout because of the personal trainer? The same is true of meditation. Sit across from some guy who's been meditating 30 years. So make sure you try those things. Uh, I want to read uh, a few things about meditation. And uh, I'm going to read one thing out of the power now. And then we're going to do uh, meditation. It's a guided imagery called the ribbon breath meditation. But here's some things that a man named Stuart Wilde says about meditation, how to meditate. Remember the most important aspect of meditation is how diligently you work on it, not how good you are at it. Discipline, willpower, and concentration will see you becoming more adept as time passes. So don't worry if it doesn't come together particularly well at first. The best posture to use is one in which you feel comfortable and where your spine is straight but not rigid. You'll soon discover the human body doesn't like being in one spot for too long. So try to position your body with as much balance as possible to avoid discomfort because you ought to sit still throughout your meditation. Keeping your body motionless is a part of your affirmation of control over yourself. The Eastern sages who formulated the practice of meditation found that poise of body favored poise of mind. Remember that concept when you find yourself slouching into a sloppy heap. It's a good idea to meditate in the same place every day. You know, starting Monday, you're going to do your prayer meditation in your rooms, 6.45 to 7. Open your big book upon awakening. One of you should read that. And the rest of you sit with your eyes closed. Consider your plans for the day. Pray. Then in the remaining time, set your timer and do your meditation. But if you'll meditate in the same place every day, it will build an energy and a sacredness that will linger long after your session is finished. It's also important to be comfortable and warm during your meditation. Wear loose-fitting clothes. Block off drafts. Best time to meditate is in the early morning before your mind is buzzing with mental activity. Pre-dawn is a good time. Since people around you are still asleep, and they have not as yet cluttered the atmosphere with thoughts and preoccupation. Early meditation helps to get the day off to a good start. On the other hand, meditating the last thing at night can help calm the mind and be conducive to a good night's sleep. It's also best not to meditate on a full stomach. Meditating at the same time each day will build up the idea of a routine. After a short while, you'll find your mind automatically turning to the practice at the scheduled hour. And if you don't meditate, you'll feel there is something missing. The duration of your meditation should depend on what feels comfortable to you. I find 24 minutes, one minute for each hour of the day, to be a good length of time. Always begin meditation by breathing deeply and rhythmically. Breathe through your nostril, keeping your mouth closed. As your meditation deepens, your breathing will most likely quiet down and become slower and smoother. Research has shown during meditation, oxygen consumption drops by as much as 20%. Once you begin to meditate, you will inevitably find yourself plagued by mental distractions. Always maintain a passive attitude toward them. When your attention begins to wander, gently pull it back to the focus of your meditation. This may be your breathing, body sensations, a mantra, an image, whatever. Do not allow yourself to become frustrated with hyperactive thoughts. Also, never try to suppress them or they'll come back bigger and more powerful each time. Just observe the thoughts and let them pass away naturally. The point of meditation is to foster acceptance and not struggle. When you begin to pressure yourself, you are no longer meditating. When the meditation is finished... Don't jump right up and get back into the swinging team. Rest quietly for a minute or so. All right. Do a reading here and then I'll have Don put in this uh, meditation for us. This is a reading from Eckhart Tolle. 
It's called addiction in the search for wholeness. It says, why do we become addicted to another person? Or you could think of drugs or alcohol. But he's addressing another person. How many of you have experience with that? The reason why the romantic love relationship is such an intense and universally sought after experience is that it seems to offer liberation from a deep-seated state of fear, need, lack, and incompleteness that is part of the human condition in its unredeemed and unenlightened state. There is a physical as well as a psychological dimension to this state. This is the reason you and I became addicts and drug addicts and alcoholics. Because we live in a constant, deep-seated state of fear, need, lack, and incompleteness. That's why we are constantly driven to get something outside of ourselves to treat this condition. And it will never treat it. Now let's go back to this romantic love relationship addiction. On the physical level, you are obviously not whole, nor will you ever be. You are either a man or a woman, which is to say, one half of the whole. On this level, the longing for wholeness, the return to oneness, manifests as male-female attraction. Man's need for a woman, woman's need for a man. It is an almost irresistible urge for union with the opposite energy polarity. The root of this physical urge is a spiritual one. The longing for an end to duality, a return to a state of wholeness. Sexual union is the closest you can get to this state on the physical level. This is why it is the most deeply satisfying experience the physical realm can offer. But sexual union is no more than a fleeting glimpse of wholeness, an instant of bliss, as long it is, as it is unconsciously sought as a means of your salvation, you are seeking the end of duality on the level of form. You all know what he means when he says duality. Here's what he means. Have you guys ever said to yourself, I can no longer stand myself? You ever said that? All of you said that, I'll bet. That implies you think there's two of you. The I and the myself that you can't stand. That's duality. What if there's only one? But it's not the one you think. Enlightenment, death of self, is the end of duality. Where on an internal level, you have an awakened spirit, you stay hooked to that spirit, conscious contact, and that's where you live and move throughout the day. And you take this awakened spirit in this body, in my case with a male named Mark, out into this one-act play and have a shitload of fun with it, but it's not who you are and you know it. It's like going to Walt Disney pretending you're goofy for the day. That's a great way for me to describe what duality consists of. <clears throat> Your need for drugs and alcohol or sex or whatever, something outside you, is your desperate need to feel a sense of oneness and in duality. Which is why the elimination of alcohol and drugs has never been our answer. Because it doesn't treat what's wrong with me. What's wrong with me is I think I'm separate from everybody and everything. And until that condition gets treated, and that happens in steps four through nine, you're going to go back to the only thing that gives you some sense of oneness. Alcohol, drugs, women, money, however... That's always short-lived. 
So then you just go through the pain-pleasure cycle over and over. Groundhog Day. Still trying to seek to end duality. To feel some sense of wholeness, oneness, completeness. That can happen through the steps, through prayer, through meditation. Meditation keeps me consciously aware that there's not two of us here, there's just one. Today I put on the Mark Houston goofy suit and go out into the world and have a lot of fun with it. No judgments about it. Nowhere to be. Don't need to be anywhere other than where I am. Right? Be goofy for the day. Move in and out of these roles all day long. Roles don't define who I am. I was unemployed before we started Mark Houston Recovery. So I went from an unemployed role to the president. It's not who I am. And I know that. It makes sense. See, that's what steps do. Four through nine. Four through nine. To break you out of that. Let's go ahead and put on the uh, uh, CD. Don? Where's Don go? Oh. Well, so again, put your feet flat on the floor. Sit up a little straight. Get your spine a little straight. And then close. Yes. So we can think about anything that has meaning to us. Yeah. If you want to, uh, yes. If you want to grab a word, like I told you, I use the word Jesus. Breathe in. Breathe out. The Ribbon Breath Meditation. 